uh, which is what it seems to be these days. So tonight we're glad to give you the opportunity to get the facts on the American shale revolution, which is also known as fracking. Um, we're very happy to have uh, a couple of representatives of Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development with us tonight. Uh, Debbie Brown is the outreach director for CRED. I first got to know Debbie through the leadership program of the Rockies, and when I saw that CRED had hired Debbie to be the outreach director, I knew they were serious about getting their message out in a, in a responsible and effective way, because Debbie is the best. Um, what CRED does is very, is very simple. It's get the facts on fracking first before you make a decision. Uh, CRED wants people to understand uh, that it's, it's energy, economic, environmental benefits of fracking. Um, you know, once again, growing up in Oklahoma, I know that those fracked wells uh, paid a lot of college tuition dollars. Um, so, uh, with no further ado, then I would like to invite Debbie Brown to come up, and I will let Debbie tell you a little bit more about Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development. Jennifer. Thank you. It sounds like Jennifer just made our case for us, which is fabulous. Um, it's great to be with you. I appreciate the invitation from Rick and Jennifer, who've been friends uh, since before they founded the Steamboat Institute. And it's wonderful to see what they've created up here. Um, they're very, very inspiring with their time and their talents, and it's great to be here. It's a great excuse to get out of Denver, too, and enjoy what you all enjoy on a regular basis. Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development was founded with that simple idea of get the facts first on fracking. Uh, the need really came about um, because Colorado is such an epicenter right now in the fight against fracking, and a lot of regular folks only hear mistruths and uh, misleading statements about fracking. So our goal is to change that. Uh, I don't know that you've seen as many of our ads up here in the Steamboat area, but we've got a huge ad campaign right now, specifically in the Metro Denver area, that invites people to go to studyfracking.com as a way to get their questions answered. The nice place about this website is pretty much every question has already been answered, and if somebody does give a question that hasn't been answered, then top scientists are put in charge of answering those questions. So the site is building upon itself pretty much every day. So we encourage folks to go to that site. Hydraulic fracturing, or what we call fracking, typically only lasts a short amount of time, but yet provides great benefit to all of us. Most of you probably already understand the benefits personally in reduced heating costs, national security implications, $30 billion of annual economic impact to Colorado, 110,000 folks employed in the energy sector here in Colorado, and on and on. A recent study that was just produced uh, actually even stipulates all the other benefits, the trickle-down economic benefits to all of us from everything from K-12 through funding, uh, infrastructure, transportation, and on and on. And I'll make sure Jennifer gets a copy of that study. It was just released this past week. Um, what we're going to hear tonight is from uh, Chris Wright, who's a very special guest of ours. He's an engineer, he's a business owner, he's an entrepreneur, and he is a specialist, a scientist, and an engineer on fracking issues and energy development. While you're listening to Chris and, get, and, Chris and getting ready to ask questions, I want you to pay uh, some consideration to the sheet that you got when you came in, if you haven't had a chance to look at this. And I'll be around after Chris's presentation to also answer questions. What this is, is a chance for you as a citizen or a business owner or a community leader to join our pro-energy coalition that we're working on through Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development. We've got, as you can see, some of our industry partners or the, the chambers here in the state, a lot of nonprofit leaders, a lot of elected leaders, and we're asking regular folks to also join the coalition. It basically says two things. One is your pro energy development in Colorado. You understand how vital it is not only to our economy, but our national security, to our heating bills, and on and on and on. But second, you also realize that a patchwork regulation approach isn't the right thing for Colorado. Essentially, uh, what could be coming on the ballot uh, this fall could be something that would 
allow 64 separate counties to have a web and a patchwork approach to regulation in our state. And uh, that's a, that takes it away from right now, it's a state constitution uh, that sets that that belongs at the state level, if that's a proper role of government to be the regulatory arm. And if you don't already realize it, probably Chris will tell you that Colorado has one of the strictest regulatory uh, environments for energy development in the country, and one of the strictest, if not the strictest, probably in the world. I mean, very, very strict regulations already at the state level. So again, as you're thinking through your questions tonight and Chris's presentation, I'd really encourage you to sign our energy coalition, and uh, we'd appreciate your support as we're trying to get out the facts on fracking. So now we're on to the main event tonight, which is to hear directly from Chris Wright. Chris grew up in Colorado. Uh, like many of you, he's a passionate outdoorsman. He enjoys hiking, backpacking, camping, cycling, skiing, and he put et cetera, because I have a feeling there's a long list of other outdoor things that we all enjoy in Colorado. He has a longtime passion for science and energy. After studying mechanical and electrical engineering at MIT, undergraduate and graduate, he became an entrepreneur in technology and energy. At age 27, he founded Pinnacle Technologies, which developed commercial technologies, uh, oops, uh, which developed and commercialized technologies that for the first time allowed direct measurements of how hydraulic fractures actually grow deep underground. These direct measurements dramatically increased the understanding of how fractures behave and provided insights that really catalyzed the start of the shale revolution. In 2000, Chris co-founded one of the first shale gas production companies, Stroud Energy. He served as chairman of Stroud while remaining president and CEO of Pinnacle Technologies. Right before Stroud's IPO, he sold it to Range Resources. And also in 2006, he turned over the reins at Pinnacle to a colleague and spent the next three years coaching all of his kids' sports teams, bike racing, and traveling with his family. But that sounds like the American dream. In 2010, Chris founded Liberty Resources, which used his fracking innovations to produce oil in the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. In 2011, he founded Liberty Oil Field Services, a hydraulic fracturing company which provides these fracking, fracturing innovations to other oil and gas producers in North Dakota, Wyoming, and Colorado. In addition to being CEO of both Liberty companies, he is on the board of several nonprofits with a focus on education and addressing poverty. Most importantly, he had the great luck of marrying Liz, who's also joined him tonight, and being blessed with two fabulous high school students. Liz's parents, some of you may have known, lived in Steamboat for eight years before their recent passing. Uh, when I got to know Chris, it's been really fun working on energy um, issues. Like many of you, it, it seems like kind of a new issue, even though fracking hasn't isn't new when you think about the technology involved. Uh, but getting to know Chris has been great and other energy producers that make our state so great and so prosperous and so free that I'm really excited to introduce you to Chris Wright tonight. Chris? Again, the home, the home of my in-laws. Um, I grew up in Colorado, and when I, when I was young, you know, you're interested in sports. Of course, my original plan was to be a professional tennis player, and that didn't work out so well. My wife, Liz, did become a professional skier, so at least someone in my family made some money uh, from athletics. But I, what, what really, what, what grabbed me next was science. You know, and, and, and like a lot of little kids, you know, just looking up at the stars in the sky, I got interested in, you know, how far away are the stars? And, uh, you know, it was tremendous to me. I couldn't believe it when the nearest star is 25 trillion miles and most of the stars that we can see with our eyes are quadrillions of miles away. And as a guy who very slowly ran the half mile, a quadrillion mile seemed like a long, a long ways. But yet we can look up and see it with our eyes, without a binocular, without a telescope. So, oh my God, that is, that's energy, that's power. And so as a young kid, I learned about fusion and how stars power themselves. And then that's, that's in junior high. Then I go to high school, and one of the things I learned early on in high school was that we were running out of oil, we were running out of gas, and running out of everything else, 
Um, and as a you know, 15-year-old, 14-year-old high school kid, I believed it, absolutely believed it. Oh my gosh, you know, I'm just getting going in my life and I want to ski and travel and you know, I'm going to be out of oil in 15 years. Um, and so that, that made it like, I'm going to be part of energy. I'm going to be part of energy's future. And one of the reasons, well, actually one of the main reasons I went to MIT was they have a tokamak, which is like a giant donut with powerful magnetic field on it that's trying to simulate the conditions of the sun and create fusion energy here. And if we're going to run out of oil in 15 years, we better get going. Pretty quickly I realized I don't have the patience to be a basic researcher, but I love technology, I loved energy. Um, and so I've been doing that the whole, t the, you know, my whole career. And I'll start with a picture of what we're going to talk about. This is in North Dakota. This is our fracturing equipment. So this is a well that's about to be fracked. Uh, the wellhead is right here. So this well goes down two miles, turns left, and goes two miles in a, a thin zone 30 feet thick that's saturated with oil. Um, and that's 27,000 horsepower on location. So, you know, is there an environmental impact? Absolutely. This is driving out. This has taken two, three acres of, of, of dirt. The good news is it's only there for a week and it's gone. Uh, this is a plant. I'm a partner in a company called Pyramax Ceramics. And uh, we invested $200 million and built a manufacturing plant in Georgia, in a small town of Rens, Georgia. And the last five or 10 plants that have been built that manufacture this product were built in China. But today, because of the shale revolution, the energy cost advantage of, of the United States more than offsets the labor cost advantage of China, and it's cheaper to build it here. So this is my personal experience, but uh, this is what I'll talk about a little bit later. This industrial renaissance is real, and it's happening. Uh, my little cartoon picture of a hydraulic fracture. I originally was going to run a video and decided not to do it. Notice there's a cutaway there. So the, the zoom in on the rocks you see is two miles underground. So there's a whole bunch of rocks. And when, when I was a kid, I pictured oil as you know, people discovered underground lakes that were full of oil, and we just got to find them. Now, I, I was disappointed when I learned later that there's no underground lakes. Underground, there's rock. The question is only what's in the pore space of the rock. 99.9999% of all of it in the world is water. Um, but there's a little bit of oil and gas. So if you find a rock, like here I've drawn a sandstone, this sandstone in this pore space has oil in addition to water. And if it flows, you think of beach sand, you know, the wave comes in and the water just flows through that like nothing. Those kind of sandstone, high permeability rocks, they exist. Uh, some in the U.S., lots of them in the Middle East, and you drill a well down and it flows through the rock and you get it out. But by about the 1940s in this country, there weren't a lot of those left. 99, well, well more than 99% of all the oil was still there, but it was harder to get out. So fracking started as you inject fluid into a well, that pressure comes up, it can't flow through the rock very well, and as that pressure comes up, eventually it parts the rock and creates a crack. And then as you keep pumping fluid, that crack keeps growing. And then you pump sand in behind it. So when, that, so when you stop pumping and that water seeps into the rock and the rock closes back up, that sand props it open. Um, and now, instead of just flowing from just the edges of that wellbore, you have this big fracture face. All the oil and gas can seep into it and then flow to the wellbore. Um, so but by the time I, I entered the industry, 90% of the wells in the US were fracked. The difference we'll talk about is just a different way to do this. The other thing I'll say is hydraulic fracturing, we say as a commercial industry, really is about 65 years old now. So it's just starting to collect social security. But rocks, the process of hydraulic fracturing, is actually hundreds of millions of years old. The vast majority, 99.9999% of all the hydraulic fractures ever created in the world are created by nature. So if you look at rocks, you drive through an outcrop, it's amazing how fractured rocks are. And some of the fractures that are very important on the micro scale, this is 80 microns, so this whole thing is you know, a fraction of a millimeter. When kerogen, oil is bit buried deep underground, remember originally it was microorganisms that lived in the ocean. They get buried, and if they're buried without oxygen, instead of breaking down there, they, they, if they're in an anoxic, no oxygen environment, they get buried, and with time, as, the glacier, as, as layers of earth are, are layered on top of that, it eventually gets hot and high pressure, 
and that, car that, that biologic matter cooks into kerogen. Kerogen's the precursor to oil. And then when it turns into oil or gas, it expands in volume and creates a hydraulic fracture. So shale rocks are full of these hydraulic fractures. All we're doing now is making our own and connecting them all up to one thing, a well bore. All right, so I told a little bit of this story already, but oil and gas, almost all of it, is produced in shale. Shale's the most common sedimentary rock on Earth. So it's all over the place. And if it's at the right depth and temperature, and it had a lot of biologic material 100 millions of years ago when it was laid down, contained in it, it becomes what we call a source rock. So oil and gas get created in this shale, and then it, over time, those, all those little hydraulic fractures form, and it seeps out. Because shale is not very permeable. Think of your kitchen counter. You put water on it, and it'll evaporate before it'll flow through the counter. Shale's like that. I'll show a picture of it in a second. You can't believe anything will come out of it. So eventually it leaks out, and it rises upward. It's buoyant towards the surface. If there's no cap rock, it vents to the surface. And all around the world, there's several thousand barrels a day of oil that vent. There's billions of cubic feet of natural gas that vent and have vented for millions of years. But most of it gets trapped. It finds some other rocks, other shales, because there's lots of impermeable rocks. More rocks are impermeable than permeable. So it floats up and it gets stuck somewhere. So conventional oil and gas drilling is finding these places where it floated up and got stuck. Since oil and gas is lighter than water, it, it goes up. So you look for bends and wrinkles on the earth. That's been the story of the oil industry, to find these pockets. And what's changed now is we're not looking for the pockets anymore. We're going to where it's cooked. We're just going to the original place, not having to worry about it seeping out or finding it. We're just putting our own, as I say, bringing our own plumbing and getting it straight out of the shale. Uh, there's a lot more gas in the world than oil. And here's a way to think of it. When it, as they say, when it gets cooked a little bit, it becomes kerogen. Think of that as like tar, a precursor to tar. And if it's down there longer, it's in the oven and it's getting hotter, eventually it becomes oil, becomes that viscous oil you think of from Canada that really is like tar. And then as it gets cooked more and more, eventually it becomes the really light, low viscosity, clean oil that's you know, almost like gasoline. Um, that's the best stuff. That's the you know, high quality oil, easy to refine, the cleanest oil. So, but there's only so much medium rare steak in the world. Usually you leave it on and you forget about it and it, it goes to natural gas liquids and if it gets fully cooked, it's gas. So the world has an unbelievable amount of methane gas. Um, if we were better chefs, we'd have more medium rare and that's what we're producing a lot these days is we're finding the medium rare, the oil. One more cartoon image, and then I'll sort of end my technical part of this talk, although I'm hoping there's questions on it. I used to give talks that were three quarters technical, because I'm too excited about the technology, and then a little bit about what it means for everybody else. And now I'm trying to change that ratio. But here's a little cartoon. As I said, if the rock is high permeability, it's easy for fluids to flow through it. You drill the well down, you know, that Beverly Hillbillies. You shot some holes in the pipe, and it gushed out, and you moved to Beverly Hills. Um, but most of the oils come out so easily. So frac fracturing started in the late 40s. So now you pump that fluid. You've got, the, think of this increased contact area. Now that rock cannot flow very easily, but boy, I'm touching a lot of it. And that, that, that drove the US oil industry in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when I got into the industry, sort of the late 80s. Um, you know, 90% of wells were fracked. The question was 95%, 98% of all oil and gas is in shale. This doesn't give enough contact area to make it come out of shale. So as I say in sort of my blind squirrel finds nut story, we came up with our monitoring technologies a way to make a more complicated fracture. Not one fracture, but a network of fractures. Now you touch enough rock, even out of shale, you can get the oil to seep out. And um, this has had bigger implications than we all realized at the time. So here, like, last cartoon. Now to do this in real rocks, here's kind of a, a, a thing. I think of this as the, the Niobrara Shale in Colorado down here. You, you drill, first you drill a hole down, typically 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet, deeper than all the fresh water. See the blue there? That's fresh water. That's the water we drink. That's the water we water our farms with, uh, our, our yards. So you drill a well through that, a few hundred feet below it, 
put steel pipe in, you pump cement down the steel pipe, it flows back up that annulus, and you basically seal off those freshwater zones. Um, then you come inside of that pipe in cement isolation, and you drill another pipe down. And it'll typically come down to either above or, or right near the shale. You'll put another piece of pipe there, cement the, the, the annulus between that pipe and the other pipe, so now I got double protection. And then you drill a third hole that turns the corner and it's in the shale rock. We pump, shoot some holes in the pipe down here and we, and we pump fluid with that frack equipment and we fracture those rocks. We put a little, then we run down in a little string, a wire line plug, and we, and we seal that off. And then we do it again and put another plug and seal it off and do it again. This allows us to get lots of plumbing, lots of contact area with the rocks. That allows us to produce oil and gas out of these rocks that nobody thought were commercial before. Nobody, everybody knew oil and gas came from there, but you can't get it out of them. All right, the shale revolution. Here's my slide in two, my talk in two slides, and you can nap after this because you'll have heard it all. Two technologies, two innovations unlocked the ability to produce oil and gas from shales. Um, one of them I talked a little bit about, which is fracturing. Instead of with fancy fluids and small amounts of expensive fluids, we use cheaper, simpler fluids, mostly almost entirely water and a little bit of stuff that's used in bowling balls that allows the water to flow more easily down pipes and then some biocides and a few other chemicals I'll talk about. Uh, and this allows us to create huge volumes of fractures. And the other is horizontal drilling was old. The first horizontal well was drilled almost 100 years ago. But the ability to steer down, make a sharp turn, hit the right spot, and then put in these plugs and these isolating devices outside of it, which are just sort of interesting material. You get materials that when you put them in, when they get hot, they expand. So it's just some material engineering, uh, advanced plumbing. Those two things together, man, we can bring our own plumbing into shales and into conventional reservoirs that weren't commercial before. Now they work. So again, we basically become better plumbers. Um, and if you can bring your plumbing, you can get oil and gas out of anything. And as he used to say it one more time, shales contain the vast majority of oil and gas in the world. Now we've got a way to tap that. What does the shale revolution mean? Um, U.S. energy production has soared. I'll show that in detail. U.S. energy prices have plummeted. This is the single biggest thing about the shale revolution. That's why I put it in red. It's right now, it's saving the average American family, family $1,500 a year. Um, for residents in Steamboat, that might be convenient, but think, think of the bottom quartile of income in the United States. This is a big deal. Um, U.S. is now the number one oil, number one natural gas producer in the world. We passed Russia two years ago and have raced far past Russia. We're the number three producer of oil um, when you include natural gas liquids, we're actually number one in this category too. 40% of our gas comes from shale. This is something that really started in scale less than 10 years ago. 35% of our oil comes from that. The shale oil thing's really been going for only about seven years. Um, all of this with private capital and market forces. Huge to me. Winners and losers. You know, we have ideas and they don't work. And we have ideas that do work. And the ideas that work run ahead. Um, and as, a, as he said, as an outdoorsman, I'm a board member of an environmental group. What I love as well is the footprint of oil and gas production is dramatically smaller. In fact, of any energy production there is, the smallest footprint we can do right now is shale. From a few acres, we generate an enormous amount of energy. Um, it's been the dominant driver of the reduction in U.S. CO2 emissions to, on a per capita basis lower than since before I was born. Um, Nothing else except the recession has contributed significantly to reduce CO2 emissions. It's dominantly been fracking and a recession. Um, greater than, and then big for, our, for the economy of the country, greater than two times energy cost advantage in the United States versus any other industrialized nation. Um, and this is launching, I'll talk a little bit more about this, what I call industrial renaissance. All sorts of production factories for steel, for, for uh, fertilizer, any energy intensive manufacturing process, the U.S. has become the cheapest place to make stuff. 
the first, the very first fractures were a couple years beforehand, but the first commercial one where somebody paid somebody else to come out, pump in their well and frack it, was 1949 in Duncan, Oklahoma. I think the date is confidential here, so it's covered up. But it was 1949. People, to, to, to Debbie's point, fracking, fracking's not new. It's been around for quite a while. And in fact, it's been done all over the world. We did a project at my original technology company about 16 years ago in Beverly Hills. Um, and not just in Beverly Hills, but right in the Beverly Hills shopping mall. So 15 wells, there's 40 wells here. We came out and fracked 15 of them right here in 1998. And everybody in De Beverly Hills cheered because they increased the revenues for all the people in the town. It was a disturbance of a few weeks. There were some big walls put up and nobody knew much what was going on except that uh, more money was flowing soon after. Well, I've, I've, I've personally been on frack efforts in Germany, in Switzerland, in Japan, in India, in Pakistan, in cities in LA. So it's been, it's been all around you and you didn't even know about it. You know, now it's on the news. It is a larger scale now, and it is going new areas. So the beginning of the shale revolution, where this began, is in Fort Worth, Texas. And you can see one of these drilling rigs here, drilling for Barnard Shale. It also was not a way out there rural thing. The shale revolution began under the city of Fort Worth and under the northern suburbs. I spoke in England recently, and one of their things is, oh, it's, 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 we're just too high of a population density in England for this. The shale revolution that ramped up it, within seven years produced as much, almost as much gas as U, the UK consumes, happened in three counties with a population density equal to Holland's, twice the population density of the United Kingdom's. Um, so when it began here, and the credit, uh, well, it's to the Barnett Shale Rock. Now if you look at that, again, think of a kitchen counter. You know, you would not imagine a lot of stuff coming racing out of that. But again, it's all about this large contact area. Here's the, 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 the and I won't, this is a little bit another technical slide again, but the, I, this is a plan map. That star in the middle is a well. Normally a fracture would be a big plane, would you know, maybe go a thousand feet long this way, but here we had this complicated network fracture. So this, this was really started, as I said, the, the, the frack that changed it all. This started commercial shale gas production. We couldn't publish this. We published a paper on this in 2001. We started doing this in 97 and 98. And Mitchell was said, well, we don't want to write anything on it just yet. But in 2001, we came out and sort of showed what was happening. Uh, here's the shale gas production. Let me tell you the quick story. So this guy, George Mitchell, started this company. He had probably 1,000 employees by the time I met him. So it was a sizable company. And they were producing gas from this area north of Fort Worth, Texas. And they had a contract, as you often do, with a pipeline company from Chicago. They said, all right, we'll pay for the transportation of the gas. We'll pay you an agreed price. You've got to supply you know, at least 300 million a day of gas. And, and, uh, and if you do that, then we'll pay for that transportation. But we need your gas. And if you drop below that, you know, then you've got to sell your gas in the market. And sort of the contract's off. And you know, we're not going to pay to transport your gas anymore. So he was highly motivated when his sort of conventional gas production was declining and it was going to cross below his agreed threshold. He had to do something. So he wasn't looking around for the world's greatest rocks. He was north of Fort Worth and had to make it happen right there. So the gas he was producing, they knew, came from the Barnett Shale. And you know, over millions of years, it leaked out. So he started efforts of taking his existing wells, drilling them deeper, and fracking in the Barnett. And he did this 36 times before he got one that paid for the cost of doing it um, over 16 years. So most people quit long before then. But Mitchell Energy, Mitchell Energy drove this. 36 wells over 15 years, losing money on every one. But that, that's American. That, to me, that's an American determination. Um, when I came in at the end here, and, you know, again, blind squirrel finds nut, together with some other guys, you know, came this idea that worked. We, we weren't there for 16 years. We had no idea that how significant this would be to Mitchell, let alone to everybody else. But Mitchell Energy started the shale revolution. Um, the shale revolution, actually I'm off by year. Really, these first stuff was 97 and 98. Natural gas prices were low then. It wasn't driven by half high gas prices. It was driven by an, an entrepreneur's determination. 
Here's the story of U.S. gas production starting around this time. So 1997. Now, all, all the early efforts of the shale revolution, nobody knew about outside of Texas. So this is, the world hadn't caught hold of this. But this is U.S. gas production. I, this looks like a boring slide, but let me talk about it for a second. You can see it's sort of ambling along flat. Around 2001, U.S. gas production peaks, and it starts to slowly decline. Um, we're still drilling. They're, they're trying to hurry me along. The production starts to decline. The average number of gas rigs drilling in the United States is 1,200 rigs. So there's lots of rigs. Which, you know, that, that's not a, a very high number. It's a normal number of drilling around the United States. But it's getting tougher and tougher. The high quality stuff's gone. Our production's declining. That's when natural gas prices elevated dramatically. The US was sp sp spent tens of billions of dollars building terminals to import natural gas from other countries so we could continue to run our power plants and heat our homes and all that. But this caused a little bit of a panic with that declining natural gas prices, declining, declining production, which as everybody in this room knows meant the price was rising. Then the shale revolution, different technology came, and the US gas production has grown about 35% in seven years, and the amazing thing is, the average number of drilling rigs, drilling for gas at that time, was 400 from 1,200. One third as many rigs drilling, and our production went from a decline to a rapid increase. In fact, it'd be increasing much more if we had uses for it as we build export capacity, as that manufacturing renaissance comes. Of course, this production can grow much more. Oil, so then it was easier for gas, as I said. There's lots of this overcooked steak. Gas is small molecules, it's easy to move. Oil's trickier, there's less of it, and it's bigger molecules. But oil right now is quite a bit more precious, because it can put in your car, or your truck, or your airplane. It's in a liquid, it's easy to transport. It has a use that we still haven't found another way to do it, to produce liquid fuels. So the shale oil revolution used the same technology from gas, and it also happened, as I said, oil's harder. Oil prices rose during this time. The world was getting shorter of energy. And oil prices rising meant we could now produce oil out of shale commercially. This is the British econ US uh, Economist magazine. That's a plot of US oil imports, right? Remember sort of the steady rise coming up, coming up. They peaked in 2005. That's what's happened in a few short years. We went from 60% imported oil in 2005 35% imported oil this year. That's in eight years. Here's US oil production over the last oh, about 100 years. Growing, growing, growing. America's doing well, growing our oil production, building our economy. The oil production peaks in the early 1970s. It declines. We find the north slope of Alaska. Huge production from Prudhoe Bay and Kapark. That's keeping our production flat, even rising a little bit. Then pretty much in my entire adult lifetime, we've had declining oil prices, rising imports of oil. That's a theme we've all heard. And then look what happened to US oil production in the last you know, five or six years from this. That's a rapid, a rapid rise. And to put it in, here, so here's the plot. Here's the data for both. It's a little bit backwards for me. The gas is on the right. That's natural gas. And this is oil. So looking at natural gas, the shale innovations are kind of here. This is sort of legacy gas. That they're, they're shales that are actually really fractured, so they don't need much fracturing. But it really starts here. Now it gets speed up. The top one is the Marcellus Shale. That's in uh, Pennsylvania that we've heard about. Uh, the blue is the Eagleford, then there's the Haynesville, then there's the, you know, the Barnett, the Woodford, so the shales are scattered around. Same story with oil. In the oil slide, the, the blue is the Eagleford in South Texas. The yellow is the Bakken, where I've been working. These are the West Texas shales. This is Oklahoma. This is Colorado. Light blue is Colorado oil production, which is small there relative to the others, but the Colorado one will grow faster than all the others in percentage terms over the next four or five years. So it's had a big impact on Colorado, but it'll be at least three times the economic value five years from now than it is today. The Colorado story is in its early phase. World oil production. As China's growing, India's growing, countries are getting wealthier, the, the consumption of oil in the developing world is growing. So it's putting a demand for more oil. Where is that more oil coming from? Historically, when that growth came, it came from the OPEC, the Middle Eastern nations and others with great oil resources. Russia was growing their oil production. 
That's the United States on the left. That's Canada right next to us. And that's most everybody else. Almost all the growth in world oil, the, the, the demand for world oil has grown about 4 million barrels over the last about six years. Three of that 4 million barrels came from the United States. You know, where would oil price be without that growth in oil production in the United States? All right, so this is a question I was me meant to ask you guys before I turned onto this slide. This is the three biggest producers of oil and gas in the world. On the right is Saudi Arabia. The red is oil plus natural gas liquids. The green is gas, natural gas. So Saudi Arabia, oil plus natural gas is about 15 million barrels of oil a day. Russia is a bigger producer because they're a massive producer of gas. They're a little over 20 million barrels of oil per day of oil and natural gas liquids and dry gas. The United States, just about to hit 25 million barrels of oil a day. So both liquid fuels and gas, United States is number one, number one in the world. The Bakken, I will give one specific example. I'm talking about the Bakken, Colorado, and some economic impacts, and then open it up for questions. The Bakken, western, western North, northwestern North Dakota's farmland. A little bit of ranch land, mostly farmland. 2006, it was dominantly a farm and ranch state. Its farm and ranch output has not meaningfully changed, but it also added the, world's, the United States' largest oil field and one of the biggest oil fields in the world. Bakken, same idea. You've seen the cartoon of drill down, turn right, go, three, you know, go two miles down, and put a whole bunch of fractures. To put it in context, in the Bakken, if I had a piece of that rock here, that shale, think of a square foot, a huge kitchen or shower tile. There's a couple thousand PSI pressure. It's deep. It's under high pressure. So we drill a fracture and put a well there. We can lower the pressure, put a huge pressure gradient across that, and we need to get one tablespoon of oil out every 24 hours. That's it. So it's just barely, if you saw it, you wouldn't even notice anything was happening. But if a tablespoon seeps out every 24 hours out of a square foot times 5 million square feet, that's 500 barrels of oil a day times a few thousand wells, it's the biggest oil field in the United States. Look, North Dakota has passed two OPEC nations. I think this year it'll pass two more. It's going to pass Algeria, and it's actually already passed Libya, but we've got to give Libya most of the credit there because their oil production has declined. But just the western part of North Dakota is a material oil producer if it was a country. There's the profile of it, the Bakken's the light blue didn't really start till 2006. The, the Bakken has its name because a farmer there, they call him Old Man Bakken, in 1952, they drilled a well on his farm and found this oil in the Bakken shale in a vertical well. A lot of oil in there. They tried several times to get it out. You can't get it out. Yeah, in 2006, it started coming out. North Dakota was 39th in per capita income in the United States in 2006, it's seventh in per capita income in 2012. Think of North Dakota as Colorado, but four or five years in front of us in Colorado. This explosion in oil production is, start, is underway in Colorado as well. In the old days, if there was oil in really tight rock that, you know, like shale, this is actually a different rock than shale, but it's like it, very tight. The only way to get it out is to drill lots of wells really close together so they can, because you can't get oil from very far away. So we used to produce tight oil like that. Now we produce it like that. That's the center of the Bakken oil field. This is the great stuff, the meat of the field. That's Lake Sakakawea there. That's a drilling rig, and there'll be a production facilities there. You can see in general, it's 90, 98% of the land, in fact, over 99, is still farm and ranch land. I'm going to zoom in to where Liberty Resources, my company's production operations are. So this is way up, this is way up in, the, in, the, in Google Maps, the town of Williston. This is, this is the Missouri River and Lake Sakakawea over there. Our production is just north of town here. All that patterning is obviously the irrigation patterns of the farms. You zoom in, you can see the farming. You zoom in right here, this is the core of our really good production stuff. Can you, everybody see all our oil equipment humming there? Everything going on, the big industrial activity? Well, 
let me help you. It's inside those circles. You can still mostly just see dirt there, but that's our wells, that's our production facilities. And what we do is, you, you, from, from one of those pads, you drill these wells down and out. You can drill up to 16 of these from that same one little splotch. They go two miles underground. They drain from that whole area, but you only use a little area to do it. And after the fact, when the drill rig's gone, the frack equipment's gone, that's a producing location uh, with four, that's only showing four of the wells there. Now let's talk about Colorado. Everybody remember the Boulder oil field? Put Boulder on the map and started some economic activity in Colorado? 1901, so I, I guess you guys like us weren't, weren't, weren't around then. Um, but that oil field produced a lot of oil. And what does it look like today? It looks like that. Now, where's the production in Colorado today? It's, it's not in Boulder, uh, but it is all around the state. And so what I want to show here is to, to, to get oil, get all this oil and gas production, people say, is there an environmental impact? And I say, absolutely. You know, you've got this prairie, and you've got to drive out there. You've got to smooth out a few acres. This giant, tall drilling rig is there. A bunch of burly guys are going to come out and make some noise. I mean, Colorado is going to last for a couple weeks. Then, probably not always as good looking as our frack trucks, but some of these frack trucks are going to come out. Park on location, again, the same few acres, 25,000 horsepower, hook up, still a bunch of burly guys, and pump into that well. This lasts anywhere from, one, really, it's a two to seven days, 10 days, and you got some delays, but it's there. Then they're going to drive away, and this is what's left. You know, gas wells at the top are just barely visible. You can see in the, in the wheat fields over there. Or if it's oil, you'll often see these pump jacks that keep the oil coming out. But it's still, it's a pretty small footprint on the surface for two miles of dense underground plumbing underneath. So most of the action is happening underground, deep underground. Natural gas prices. Factories run not on electricity. Factories generally run on natural gas because it's the cheapest energy and it can burn hot and clean. So if you want to manufacture something at a high temperature, around the world, it's almost always done with natural gas. So think of this as the price of powering a factory. Um, blue is Asia, red is Europe, green is the United States. We are $4, a Europe right now is 10 to 12, Asia is Japan, China, $16. So if you're using energy to make stuff, Boy, the rest of the industrialized nations are at a significant disadvantage in the U.S. I flew on a plane recently from a guy from the South African, a giant sasshole, a giant petrochemical company around the world. They said it's very hard to justify investment. And they're all around the world. Very hard to justify investment anywhere but the United States. In fact, in Europe, they're waking up to shale gas because almost all the energy intensive and petrochemical industries in Europe, it's, it doesn't make sense to stay in Europe. They want to move to the United States, and lots of them are, but it's, it's a political problem to see your industry and your, and your jobs migrate to the United States. Now, they should develop shale gas too, and that's what I tell them, but right now, it's happening here, and we're reaping the benefits. What if the shale revolution hadn't happened? This is another, these aren't my opinions, actually. This is another economic consulting group study of this. Um, your natural gas bill today would be two to three times higher. Your annual household disposable income would be $1,500 less. The U.S. would be importing 14 to 16 billion cubic feet a day, so a quarter to a third of our consumption. That gas on the world market today costs $12, not the $4 that domestic producers sell. Um, that's a $70 billion increase in our, our gas production bills. And we'd be importing about twice as much oil as we import today and cost us a little more than $100 billion extra per year to do that. Gasoline, you know, by this consulting group's estimate, higher, without all that U.S. oil production growth, clearly oil prices would be higher. Gasoline would probably cost around $5 a gallon. 2.1 a million American jobs wouldn't be here. Our, uh, the $2.4 trillion of shale, inv shale investment from the last five years and the next 15 obviously wouldn't happen if there was no shale revolution. Uh, the renaissance in U.S. manufacturing that's just beginning obviously wouldn't be happening. The 12% drop in United States greenhouse gas emissions wouldn't have happened. 
Our GDP estimated over this 10 year period from basically we're in the middle of now would be $3.3 trillion yes, less. Because it's not just the energy, it's the use of the energy, the factories, the jobs that do that. Um, and the US, by these guys' estimate, would be in an extended period of low to no economic growth. Here's my favorite slide. My other issue, besides being a science nerd from a kid, is poverty. You know, I grew up as a little kid and, you know, southeast Denver, it was, you know, comfortable. And I go to downtown Denver and there's very poor people on the streets, uh, young and naive. Like, how does that exist in a, in a wealthy world, in a wealthy country? Um, that's a longer story. But what does it mean for the poor? Um, the average natural gas price reduction before the shale revolution really got, got scale, gas was over $7. Um, in 2012, it was under $3. That saves the households of the country $112 billion. Um, the poor are disproportionately benefit from this. If you're wealthy or middle income or whatever, energy's a noticeable amount of your income, but it's not huge. If you're poor, to heat your house, to power your truck, it's, it's the same for everybody. So as a percent of your income, it's much, much bigger. So in the US, we have 36% of US households that qualify for low income home energy assistance. Um, this, this is about $3.5 billion of government assistance to help these people produce energy. The, that helping these people produce energy, $3.65 billion from the US government, $10.4 billion from the shale revolution, just by market forces reducing the cost of their gas what it otherwise would be. Um, blue collar jobs, if you look around, they tend to be in energy intensive industries, manufacturing, farming, transportation, you know, stuff that moves. If you're a banker, lawyer, an advertising exec, you know, your, your personal life isn't as nearly as impacted by energy. I love the fact the economic benefits are huge and that they disproportionately go to lower income people. How would a moratorium on fracking affect the poor in Colorado or in the country? I'll tell you how it is impacting the blue collar population in England. London's booming and it's beautiful. You go to Liverpool or Newcastle and you have burnt out apartment buildings, you have shuttered factories, you have a bunch of people living on government assistance and looking to migrate in the country that began the Industrial Revolution. You know, because of cheap energy and innovation, and now they've shut it down. Um, it's a sad state of affairs in England, and we don't want that here. Um, Colorado oil and gas industry, Debbie hit a number of these points, but to hit them real quick, it generates about 11% of Colorado's GDP. And again, that percent will be a lot bigger five years from now because of the growth. For example, 110,000 direct jobs, royalties to landowners of about 600,000 people. It's at one-twelfth of Colorado's property taxes. 1.6 billion in total revenue to the state and local governments. Almost 700 million of that goes to the schools in the states. We produce enough gas. We only consume a quarter of the gas we consume in Colorado. Three quarters of the gas we produce, we export to other states. With oil, we produce about enough oil for half the Coloradans. Within three years, we'll produce more oil than all the Coloradans, and in five years, we'll be a significant, as a state, net exporter of oil. Um, our industry, this, this energy industry, has experienced 40% job growth from 2007 and 2012. You know, what, what other industries had any job growth, 2007 and 2012? Um, and again, big to me, the footprint on the land. Colorado is beautiful. We got wilderness, we got open spaces, we got beautiful farm and pasture lands. What's great about the shale revolution is we use far less land on the surface than older oil production and than almost any other energy production technology. What about all the bad stuff? Because we hear a lot about that. I hear a lot about that. Um, and let me hit at least the ones that people hear a lot. These two gas land movies, you know, that show tap water lighting on fire, which of course alarm people, not just in this country, but in Europe and around the world, everywhere I go. We don't want to light our things on fire. Colorado, the first one was a farm just outside of, uh, just outside of Denver. And of course in Colorado, like a lot of places, those shallow fresh waters, there's coal seams in them. Um, and when you drill a water well, if you don't cement off those coal seams, you get methane in your water. So that existed. The Indians were, saw the methane in the water hundreds of years ago in Colorado. So th that has nothing to do with the wells that are drilled a mile and a half beneath those aquifers. The one in Texas in Gasland 2 is even more ridiculous. It was actually a water well, a very old water well in 
Texas that was it was a big well and it had a vent line that you know from 50 years ago that to vent out the natural gas from the water you know so they went out in the movie and lit the gas vent line on a water well you know nothing to do with fracturing or the shale revolution but uh, fracking uses millions of gallons of water and it does millions of gallons every well but you got to put that in context. Everything's got to be in context. Fracking uses 0.13% of Colorado's water. So we're less, a little more than 0.1% of our water for 11% of our GDP. Another way to look at it is that they, the oil and gas industry is 80 times more water efficient than the average industry in Colorado. Um, and we'll probably get up to 0.25% of the water when, the, when we're 20% of the GDP in Colorado. Um, fracking causes earthquakes. Um, and it does create very small, you know, trillions of times larger than you can feel at the surface, smaller than you can feel at the surface. You know, hydrothermal power, uh, geothermal, mining, any, any activity subsurface creates earthquakes. Fracking, is, is, since it's so localized, they're quite small. The bigger ones we hear about, some have nothing to do with fracturing. And there is an issue with water disposal injection. As that is ramped up, if you put too much water for months and months into the same well, it has generated some magnitude two and magnitude three earthquakes, which are just getting to the point that you can actually feel them at the surface. That's an engineering problem. They need to drill more wells, they need to target better zones, Zones, very fixable problem, but there's something there for sure. It's small, but it's real. Um, fracking causes groundwater contamination. This one, of course, drives me crazy. Um, fracturing, as we said, 65 years old. There's been really about 3 million estimate fractures pumped, well over 1 million wells that have been fractured. And the EPA, which has been looking very carefully at it, which is fine, as they should, has, admits themselves there's not one example in 65 years of a frack growing up and ever touching groundwater. But that was a big advocate in the 1990s, and it's grown, that fracking is a tremendous way to dispose of things. In LA County, one of the municipal treatment plants, they don't want to build a new municipal treatment plants, so they dispose of their municipal waste by injecting it a mile underground, you know, essentially in a fracture in a reservoir. Think of that, oil and gas, it's a mile, two miles underground. Think of your soda can, how fast those bubbles rise in your, in your glass. When there's gas in water, it goes up fast. It's been down there for a hundred million years. If it could get up to the surface, boy, it, 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 would, it would have done it a lot less than a hundred million years. And as, as you saw my cartoon, what we frack is quite deep. Uh, fracking causes greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, burning any hydrocarbon does. Farming, anything we do does. But fracking has been the dominant driver of our reduction in CO2 emissions. And in fact, truth be told, in water, it's also a significant reducer in the use of fresh water. I talked about the small amount of water we use for natural gas. It's, it's large in gallons. In percent, it's not that big. But when you produce more natural gas, the extra gas today almost dominantly is going to produce electricity. And so instead of producing it with coal, we produce it with natural gas. The amount of, to produce the same amount of electricity with gas versus coal takes somewhere between 10 and 30 times as much water with coal. So every extra, you know, billion cubic feet of gas we produce, there's that much less coal used in power production. So we're actually reducing fresh water usage in the country by growing natural gas production. The main issues, and I'll be very quick on these, but these are real, and I, you can have the handouts. These are things that to me really matter. Community and landowner issues. We're drilling wells in people's backyards or, or their ranches, not generally in their backyards, but they're in communities. And if I live in a community and a bunch of big trucks are driving, that matters. So, you know, is there an impact of this? Absolutely. So you, you want the economic benefits of it, you want to balance, the, the disturbance isn't too great. There are some areas, you know, we probably won't frack in Beverly Hills anymore, and that's fine. Um, but it, that, that's a trade-off. That's a real community issue. Well integrity, as they say, cementing the outside of the well board, that's essential. That's what prevents fluids from coming up. When the oil and gas industry started in 1859, for the first 44 years until 1903, they didn't cement any wells. We didn't do it. So that all the old wells drilled in Pennsylvania and Ohio and New York, they had no cement. Obviously, the technology got better. We started cementing. Today, the cementing is very high tech. In Colorado, there are strict regulations. You, after you cement, you run a, a, a measuring tool down and make sure you got a good seal. I am 100% in favor of that. Um, surface handling. With fracking, you do bring fluids with chemicals out on location. If you spill those in somebody's farm or in somebody's creek, 
That's groundwater contamination. But that's a surface handling facility thing. Of course, there's tight regulations on that. The technology gets better and better to put, you know, produce a spill barriers. So even if it's spilled, it's captured under our frack trucks. There's basically bins that catch what gets dropped or what gets spilled. So this is getting better and should be getting better. Produced water, when you produce oil you, and produce gas, you also produce water. That's water from deep underground. This is not fresh water. It needs to be handled carefully. Generally, and almost all of it is just drilled, is injected back into another well and returned to where it came from. But if you spilled that water on a farm, it's very salty, you know, not fresh water. You don't want that on your farm. So there are, of course, like any industrial process, there's things that have to be done carefully. Um, Air pollution, most of the air pollution is from running a bunch of diesel trucks. It's like sitting in a traffic jam. The main thing we're doing right now with that is converting over more and more frack trucks from burning diesel to burning natural gas. Very clean burning, cheaper. So in five years in Colorado, you will dominantly see natural gas burning trucks. Today, it's dominantly diesel, but that transition is happening. Um, traffic and noise, and again, this to me is back to this community thing. These are real issues and they need to be balanced. CO2 emissions, I already talked about that, but there's the data if you've ever seen it. Quite a dramatic drop the shale revolution has led. And my last slide, the U.S. shale revolution has transformed the U.S. and the world energy situation. Not just natural gas prices, which are domestic, but even world oil prices have been impacted. Um, it has been, uh, the U.S. will, all of our oil in the United States will soon come from uh, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. We won't need oil outside of that. Natural gas will move from, from uh, will soon become a net exporter, and that could be a growing industry here. I talked about our energy cost advantage. All Americans benefit economically from this, but disproportionately to the lower income folks. Um, Colorado is a net gas exporter, and we soon will be for oil. That's a few years away. So you think of the economic benefits Debbie talked about in Colorado today. Those are going to double in the next few years. Um, that's it. I went a little bit long, but uh, appreciate everybody's interest. Absolutely. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Yeah, Chris, I wanted to compliment you first of all on, <clears throat> on the presentation and also on the fact that you keep um, clean equipment and, and up-to-date equipment and so forth. I've been following a little bit the uh, development in North Park and I guess the question I have is since you're bringing up all the, all the respective um, issues related to this is, is how about when a well is, is abandoned? Um, how do we make sure that uh, the contractors who are coming on site have enough financial wherewithal uh, to follow through with the regulations that Colorado Gas is Colorado Oil and Gas Commission has put there, and um, how come in some areas the latest technology isn't being used? I notice you are, but there's you see a lot of the pump jacks versus um, versus vertical pumps still, um, and you see a lot of flaring, which has really affected uh, the night sky and the and the, the visual aspects of North Park. So maybe you could talk about some of the follow-up stuff to fracking. All all great questions and, and all and all very real issues. Um, one is on the regulations, it, it, as Debbie mentioned, there, there's different regulations in different states for uh, old wells and, and, and procedures for plugging and abandoning them. And those restrictions have continued to get tighter. I absolutely support that. So it's not the contractors, it's the operator company, the EMP company that's drilling those wells um, that is responsible for the plugging and abandoning, response, plugging and abandoning responsibility of that. Um, you know, are there gonna, could, could, could there ever be a very small company that goes bankrupt and can't do that? that that's, I mean, it's, it's certainly happened, but I think the state and other, other companies or industries will generally step up to, to make sure those things are, are covered. Today, with our revolution, we drill far less wells. Each well is much more expensive, but the number of wells being drilled compared to 50 years ago is dramatically less. So still a very real issue, but it's going down. With technology, of course, those things always, they, they, they come with time. You know, when you know, new cars displace old, dirty, burning gasoline cars, but they're still old and 
dirty engine cars on the road? Absolutely. But th th those get displaced. And as the industry has been growing, I think we have a faster rate of retiring old equipment. But is there old equipment around? Absolutely. You know, and I think that, that, will, that will phase out with time and growth. Because the new equipment's not only better, but it's actually more efficient. So it's cheaper, if you have the capital to buy the newer, fancier equipment, it's actually cheaper to operate. So it, it takes some time, but, but it's, uh, it's on the way. Flaring is a, is, is, is a big issue. You drill an oil well, and you produce oil. But every time you produce oil, you produce natural gas, and usually water, too. In Colorado, the, the production is very dry, so there's often not a lot of water. But you produce oil, and you produce gas. And when you first drill a well in a new area, oil you can flow out and store in tanks, and you can put more tanks, and then you can truck it away and put it in a pipeline and sell it. But gas, you only can capture and sell if you've got a gathering line, a, basically a pipeline that that gas comes out. And first it goes into a separator, it gets separated out, and that gas will be taken via a gathering line to a pipeline to, be, to market. But if it's a new exploratory area, you don't know if it's going to work. And it takes a while to get right arrays to put that pipeline in. So flaring happens when you're in a new area and the infrastructure's not there yet. And it does disturb the night sky. It's burning gas instead of using it. Um, it's, definitely, it's definitely a negative. But uh, the only way to reduce flaring is to get infrastructure built as quickly as possible. Even in North Dakota, I talked about, you know, it's six years old now. It's a million barrels of oil a day of production. It's a billion cubic feet a day of gas. But about a quarter of the gas is still flared. And it's because we've not been able to build all the gas processing plants and the infrastructure to get that gas to market. And if you, can't if you, if you don't produce that gas or flare that gas, you can't get the oil out. So it's a timing thing. Colorado, there's certainly less flared gas, but there is flared gas. Chris, our videographer has asked that you move back into the light for purposes, and then we have another question. Okay. Now, I hope that wasn't sinister. I was in the dark for a bit there. Hi, Chris. You mentioned the earthquake issue and little ones. I'm going back a few decades, but I recall when Rocky Mountain Arsenal injected some pretty toxic stuff, and it caused a bunch of little ones in the Denver area. And research into it turned out the fact that those little ones probably re reduced stress that could have led to a very big one. And I wonder if there's any geological res research that might be a good sales point for you in that regard. Yeah, but what, but what you say now, of course, is generally accepted and known as true. You know, earthquakes come because different pieces of the earth are moving relative to each other. You know, just think of a fault and the thing is sliding along there. So it, 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 it wants to slide and it gets hung up and it gets stuck and eventually it ruptures and creates an earthquake. So to your point, when little earthquakes happen, it means it's creeping a little bit. It wants to move a certain direction and it's moving a little bit. And if it moves small amounts, you don't feel it at the surface, you're effectively releasing a little bit of that stored up energy. But generally, the energy in frack-induced earthquakes is very, very small. If you, in fracking, most of the, the earthquakes, what we call micro seisms, small seisms, they're minus four to minus two magnitude. And it's a logarithmic scale. So every, every two magnitudes you go up is a thousand. Um, so you know, from minus two is you know, a thousand times to one, uh, 10, a thousand times, zero is a thousand times, a million times. You've got to go up about a trillion times in energy to feel it at the surface. Those are the typical ones. But if you drill a well and inject right into a fault, in fracturing, you know, people generate minus one, zero, plus one magnitudes. But you generally need about three to feel it at the surface. I don't think fracking has ever produced an earthquake you can feel at the surface. Oil and gas production, disposal water in wells, has, led, has created, I believe, a few earthquakes that you can feel at the surface. That problem can be fixed with just more injection wells, better mapping so they're not near faults, um, and different, you know, targeting different zones to inject them into. So it's an engineering problem, but it's, it's a very low seismic risk, and it'll become an even lower one. Uh, Chris, thanks for coming. I am... Um... I came here, I've, I've been doing a lot of research myself. I came here with all kinds of things and I thought I was gonna nail you on stuff. I'm not. <laughs> You've answered a lot of questions. So here's my stuff. <laughs> I do have one question. Um, well, first of all, it seems like 
Colorado has been, is, is kind of the epicenter of, of uh, two industries that the country is really looking at on, on how we are doing it. One is fracking, the other one is legalized marijuana. <laughs> I don't know if they're connected or not, but uh, my only question that I have left is why did Dick Cheney get in 2005 the Clean Water Act, or the Clean Air Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act pretty much viscerated for fracking? Great, great questions. And, and the, even the stuff you tore up, I want to hear about over a beer. Because um, uh, it, it warms my heart that people like you are reading and researching and looking into this stuff. That is fantastic. The best way to understand this is to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, fortunately, I believe there's more good than bad and ugly. But uh, that generally is a misunderstanding. Of course, n nothing like that really happened at all. Fracking regulations started long before there was a Clean Water and Clean Air Act. Um, and so when they started the Clean Water Regulation Act, it's for surface waters. It's for water that humans will come in contact with. So it's rivers, it's streams, it's groundwater that humans will drink and become in contact with. So it was decided when those acts were passed that fracking is, 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 is like regulating volcanoes or something. It's below, way below the waters that humans interact with. So it was decided when the law was passed, this, this wasn't in the purview of what that law was passed for. And then multiple times, that's been reviewed in, or a couple times, that's been reaffirmed in Congress. So there was no special, it used to be, and it was carved out or whatever. And, and, it, and of course, it's also a misstatement, by, by, not by you, but by others, that if, if, if a hydraulic fracture truck drills up and we spill chemicals and it goes in the water, that's Clean Water Act, that's Clean Air Act. We are subject to those. The stuff that we pump two miles underground and it's more than a mile from any drinking water, that's not in the purview of the act, and it never has been. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> the the uh, drilling on the uh, big rigs in the ocean, is that fracking or a whole different concept? And then what's the pros and cons in one or two sentences, uh, one versus the other? Yeah, great, great question. So the stuff in the ocean, this is, as I said, that great rocks. They're generally not fracked. Sometimes they are, but when they are, it's a small frack. So that's producing oil and gas from rocks that it's easy to get it out, but it's hard to access them because they're you know, in an ocean and you've got to drill down deep. So they're just different things. There's growth in oil production coming in both ways on both. And they really have different trade-offs. So it isn't one's good and one's bad. One thing that happened bad that infuriates me is the BP oil spill that happened. So that's deep drilling into fancy stuff offshore. And, and their mistakes were basic, and they should never have happened. You know, basically, after you put the pipe in, they did not cement and seal the outside of the pipe. Like, there's never been a blowout like that onshore in the U.S. in 100,000 wells drilled. And so you go to a place where there's more oil, more pressure, more things, and they make, like, the most basic mistake. It's like backing up your car and, you know, running over someone, which actually still happens much more than the cement thing. I mean, it's just, just a horrific series of bad decisions led to that. I, I don't think you will see that again in offshore. I, I, I wouldn't have thought you'd seen that one. I think it's relatively anomalous. There's been that one. The, the, the Mexicans did a similar thing about 40 years ago. Um, but I think that, that, that has been and will, should, be a, you know, should not happen again to that magnitude in any of our lifetimes, and hopefully for you know, m much after that. So they're different, but, uh, and I don't work in the other one as much, but uh, they both have their pluses. I think we have one time for one last question. I'll hang around for beers after for anyone who has any more questions. I, I want to hear them all. Thank you, Chris. Um, you mentioned the chemicals that uh, get injected and indicated most of that is just water. Uh, but at the same time, there's been a lot of uh, hesitancy to share exactly what goes into the ground, and I think that just generates a lot of suspicion. Would you please elaborate on that just a little more for us? Tell us what it is and why the uh, reluctance to share and how it is uh, regulated, if you would, please. Great question. I, I really appreciate that. And I, I do have a, a few slides on frac fluids, and I decided I was already too long. I didn't, I didn't go into them, but I'll leave this up for anybody who wants to talk about it after. But you raise a point that I think was a big mistake in our industry. You know, people didn't want to release what was in them because there's different frac companies. I run one. You know, there are 60 of them, right? 
So we all go out and we pump fluid and we design and engineer this process, but one of the things we do is we make our own frac fluids. And I think too many companies thought, well, we want, we want to sell our special sauce, you know, and tell them this guy is different than his special sauce, so we don't want to tell them what's in it. Um, it's a little bit of a mar marketing gimmickry, but by, but by resisting so long to do it, I think they stirred public paranoia and concern about it, and rightfully so. Somebody's drilling in my backyard and injecting some chemicals underground, they won't tell me what it is. I wouldn't like it either. So I, th I think our industry was foolish in that. Um, we've always been open to tell anybody you know, exactly what we're pumping in anybody's well. Um, but I, I commend Colorado as the first state to step forward and pass a law, I think about two years ago, you know, and create a frac focus website so that every well is fracked. You report what chemicals went in that well. And, 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 and to your point, this should have been 10 years ago. If anybody, but once anyone started asking and was curious about it, bam, put it out there. But for f foolish, not even serious commercial interests, this was resisted for far too long. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to give one more plug for Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development. Chris and I will both be in the back for any questions that you might have for us, and I would love to encourage you again to sign that pledge form. Uh, one last thing. I think when you hear somebody like Chris, who's an innovator and an entrepreneur in energy, I don't know about you, but it makes me a little bit optimistic about the future of our country, uh, the future of the state of Colorado, and all the great benefits that we have from innovators like Chris who are willing to work hard on all these uh, problems. I laughed at his bio, MIT, three or four companies. Uh, we need more slackers like Chris, don't we? Anyway, 